Ephesians chapter number one, and briefly, by way of review, we're not going to spend a long time in review because we want to get to the message part this morning, but we understand the book of Ephesians, we're, we're talking about all spiritual blessings. That's what verse three tells us. Things that the world can't take away. No matter how bad of a day you may be experiencing, we are still blessed spiritually, and God's chosen us and adopted us. And if you've trusted him as Savior, he's pardoned and, and, and forgiven and, and purchased, redeemed. We've seen all these things. We saw specifically that the Father planned your salvation and Jesus paid for your salvation. Last week, if you recall, we, we looked at the Holy Spirit preserves your salvation. It's not any of our good work that got us saved. Watch this. And it's not any of our good work that's going to keep us saved. It's the Holy Spirit that does. And we praise the Lord for that truth. Back two weeks ago, when we were studying the topic that Jesus paid for our salvation, we were in verse number seven. Look at that briefly, if you would, where we'll find the title of our message today. The Bible says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, notice, according to the riches of his grace. The riches of of his grace. At the moment of salvation, we were given grace. And it wasn't just the grace we sang about a little bit earlier that covered all our sin. There's other grace that God gave you and God gave me that we have access to as a Christian. We looked at the first one two weeks ago. We saw it was the grace of enlightenment. Verse number eight says, wherein? Now, where are we talking about? The riches of his grace. In, in that riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded or abundantly given, abounded toward us in all. And here's the two things, wisdom and prudence. Do you recall two weeks ago we talked about what wisdom and prudence are? Wisdom and prudence is the understanding, the insight into practical issues of today. Well, we need that, don't we, as a Christian especially, to see through what the world may tell us is true and see what God's word tells us is true and how that applies to our lives. We saw two weeks ago that with the grace of enlightenment, we can understand God's purposes better. He gives us insight. And verse number 12 shows us that we can understand our purpose better. What's our purpose in life? Why am I here? As a Christian, we don't have to ask that question that so many people ask. Why? Because we've been given the grace of enlightenment. We understand our purpose is to bring him praise and glory. The grace of enlightenment. Today, as we pick back up in verse number 15, we're going to see more of the grace that he's given. Now, remember, this isn't some grace that's going to run out if we keep using it. No. Oh, no. This is according to the riches of his grace, which is abundant. We're going to see, I believe we're only going to get to two of them today. We started with the first one, so this will be number two and then number three. And we're going to save the fourth one, Lord willing, for next week. That will conclude our chapter. Verse number 15, 16, 17, and 18 we'll look at this morning with this thought, the riches of his grace. But before we jump in, let's bow for prayer. We'll begin this part of the service. Thank you, Lord, for the time we've had worshiping you in song. Thank you that... Uh, we have a blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. He that hath the Son hath life. Thank you for preserving that Holy Spirit. Thank you that we can draw nearer to you. What, what wonderful grace, grace that's greater than all our sin. Lord, we, we desire our lives to, to count for Jesus. Lord, all of this is prepare our hearts to hear your word preached. And so now I ask that you would help us, that you would guide us, that you would clear our minds of other things and distractions and focus in on what thus saith the Lord, according to your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We sell the grace of enlightenment. I want us to see, second of all today, the grace of endearment. You know, the moment of salvation, God gave you and God gave me the grace of endearment. See, what do you mean? Notice verse number 15. Bible says, wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Now you'll recall the writer of this book is Paul, writing to this church at Ephesus, which in my opinion 
was his favorite church. It's where he spent the longest time, three years. It's where he went back and visited the elders. It's where his closest uh, one that he mentored, uh, his sidekick, his son in the faith, Timothy, pastored in the church at Ephesus. So he's got a lot of interest in this church and these people. Love them dearly. And, and he, he has this grace of endearment. He recognizes that they have the grace of endearment. And this is a grace of endearment that all of us as Christians, as believers, should have as well. The pastor, what, what is the grace of endearment? I believe we're told two separate characteristics of this grace. First of all, God has given you and I grace, number one, to have faith in the Lord. That's something you may have not considered before. Did you know that your faith in the Lord is only because of his grace? Your faith in the Lord is only because of his grace. Now, our faith in the Lord, our Christian life commences. It begins with faith, doesn't it? When we come to the Lord in salvation, we take our, our faith off of ourselves, off of everything else, and put it solely on Christ. We don't put it on Christ plus other things or on Christ plus ourselves. It's there's no other hope. I put my faith and trust in Christ. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. So we understand the Christian life, or we must understand, the Christian life begins, commences by faith. You understand it doesn't begin at your baptism? In fact, it doesn't begin with any work of your own. Pastor, what, what are you trying to say? I believe we see examples of this in Scripture throughout, but perhaps the most clear was when Jesus was on the cross. There were two thieves that were dying at the same time. One rejected Christ and one almost put down the other thief and said, how dare you? This is, this is the Son of God. And he, he looked to Jesus and said, today, he said, when thou comest into thy kingdom, remember me. What did Jesus say? As soon as you get baptized, buddy, no. <laughs> Soon as you work for me and prove that you really mean it. No. What did he say? Today thou shalt be with me. What, what are we saying? The Christian life begins with faith. First John 5, 11 through 13, you can look at it later, but it basically simply says, he that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. When we have Christ, when he comes into our heart, we have eternal life. It begins, the Christian life commences with faith, but second of all, the Christian life continues with faith. You know, that faith that we come to the Lord in should not be the end of our faith. It cannot be the end of a Christian life, uh, faith. The, the Bible says throughout Scripture, the just shall live by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith not by sight. It's amazing to me to hear testimony of certain individuals and to see folks that can come to the Lord as Savior, can put their faith in the Lord for their eternal destination, but won't have faith for Him today. That boggles my mind. And I'm guilty of it as well. I can trust God with my eternity, but I can't trust Him to take care of me today. May that not be the case. The Christian life continues with faith. And by the way, how do I get that faith? Only by the grace of God. I, Pastor, I just can't have that. I just can't do that. What you're saying is that his grace isn't enough for you to do that. Because our faith in the Lord is according to the riches of his grace. You can your Christian life commenced by faith, continues by faith, but I believe Scripture teaches us that Christian life also should conclude with faith. This very same writer, Paul, as he's writing to the pastor, Timothy, his very last letter in 2 Timothy 4, the last words of his last letter, said, he said, the time of my departure is at hand. And then he gave us the verse, verse number seven, I have fought a good fight. I finished my course. What's the last phrase? I've kept the faith. He, he came to the end of his journey recognizing his life was about to be over and he didn't say it wasn't worth it. He ended with faith. Oh, let me tell you the sweetness it is to be with those who are at the end of their journey still with faith in the Lord. 
It's a wonderful testimony. I shared in our first service, I was mentioning with Miss Deborah yesterday, I, I vividly recall sitting with, with her husband, our member of our church, with John Fogarty, this hospital bed, days, hours before he entered into eternity. And I remember a conversation I had as he held my hand there on his bed and, and, and he said, you know, Pastor, my favorite verse has been, I have not seen nor have heard, nor neither entered the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him, but I'm going to see it soon. I said, what, what, what do you want me to share? What do you want me to tell others? Some of your, he said, just, just tell them what, what you keep telling the church. Love God and love people. Oh, it's worth it. Invest your life. In, it, it's worth it. He didn't come to the end and say, uh, fully with all that stuff, just go do whatever you No, no, no. He included his life with faith in the Lord. May we determine. Christian, believer this morning, I'm not just going to come to the Lord in faith for salvation. I want to continue with faith in the Lord. I want to conclude my life someday with faith in the Lord. How can I do that? The grace of God. It's according to the riches of his grace. Our faith being in the Lord, not in our circumstances. Our faith being more, we saw last week, more than just a belief, but an action. Living by faith. God gives us the grace of endearment to have faith in the Lord, and that leads to the second grace that he gives us, not just to have faith in the Lord, but second of all, to have love for the brother. Now, that first one, we can kind of get behind and get excited about. Yeah, I want to have faith. This second one's tough. To love people? Hold on. To love Christians? Some of them are hypocrites. Right. Some of them are just unlovely. God says, I've given you the grace of endearment. Verse 15, wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. Paul said, I've heard about your love. Love that you have for the saints. Turn back if you would, it may just be one page to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 13, the Bible says this, For brethren, again, we're talking to Christians here, ye have been called unto liberty. I'm free in Christ. I can do what I want. He's given me freedom. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So the truth is God has given us liberty in Christ, and, and but that liberty is not for me. Oh, no. That liberty is for me to use to serve one another. Verse 14, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. I don't think I need to break down what those words bite and devour mean, do I? We understand that and sometimes we're naturally good at that. And yet God says, no, 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 Christian, I've given you the grace to love others, to love other believers, to love all the saints. We ought to have a genuine love and fellowship with other believers. You know, we're not in a contest with other churches who preach Christ. Let me say it again. We're not in a contest with other churches who preach Christ. Amen. We're all on the same team. Amen. Some may this and some may differ this way and some may differ this way. But if they're preaching Jesus Christ, the Savior, and they're preaching doctrines from Scripture, we're not in a contest. I shared this in an earlier service as well. We have uh, families here in our church that at one time or another are part of other churches. We're not in a contest with them. I've spoken with four or five several different pastors, whether we have folks here that go there or there that have come here and as we're all in it together. Amen. The desire is that we grow in Christ. Amen. Why? God's given us the grace of endearment to love the brethren. In fact, what did Jesus tell his disciples this last week on earth? By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If ye have love one for another. Who is he talking to? The believers. If you have love one for another, this is the grace of endearment. Now, before we go to the next grace, I want us to understand these two things about our faith and love. Our faith 
and our love do not earn us rights in the work of God. Here's what I mean. We don't have faith in the Lord and, and love people so that we'll be approved of God. We don't love the Lord and love people and have faith in the Lord so that God will accept us. Watch this. Or that so other people will notice us or so that we get recognized over here. Our faith and love do not earn us rights in the work of God. Our faith and love are evidence. They're evidences of our work for God. Here's the difference. I'm going to have faith in the Lord. I'm going to love people because if I do that, then I'll get this and this and he'll see this and I'll measure up to this. No, no, no. It's not I do these things in order to get this. It's God's given me his grace to be able to have faith in the Lord and to love people. My, my faith in the Lord and my love for people is an evidence of God's grace in my life. Not a token to earn something. Oh, the faith in the Lord and the love for the brethren may be the same, but the motive behind it is completely different. And God cares about our motives, by the way. He knows. And, 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 and the Bible says well, we'll be tried by fire of what work it is. We don't do things in order to be recognized. We do things because of God's grace. Oh, I, I want to exercise faith in the Lord because he's given me the grace of endearment. I, I want to love people because he's given me the grace to do so. May I be filled with faith and love. Because it's out of the riches of his grace. The grace of endearment. And number three this morning. We've seen the grace of enlightenment and the grace of endearment. We'll spend a little bit of time on this one. Third of all, the scripture tells us we have the grace of enrichment. Enrichment. Oh, I, 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 if I had to choose, I would say this one's my favorite. But it's because it's the point we're on right now. I think the other one was my favorite a little bit earlier. But now I, I love each one of these. The grace of enrichment. Notice verse 17. The Bible says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. May give unto you. Do you see where we get wisdom and revelation? Now, hold on. What does God give us wisdom and revelation for? Well, I'll tell you what it's for. It's so that I can tell other people, this is what's going to happen, and these are the events that are going to happen, and, and he, God's given me revelation so that I can see ahead in your life and in my life. Oh, no, that's not what it's for. That wisdom and revelation is not to advance me in any way. What does it say? He's given us the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Notice in the knowledge of him. Do you understand that God has given you the grace of enrichment, first of all, to know Christ better? Let me say it again. To know Christ better. He's given his grace to allow you to get closer to him. How close are you to Jesus? You know, I believe far too many Christians, I mentioned this on Thursday night, have the mentality of I'm going to stick my head in the sand yep. in regards to doctrine and theology. Yep. And, and they say this, they raise their hands up and say, I don't know about all that. I just want to love Jesus. That sounds innocent, doesn't it? It sounds like I just want to love Jesus. I don't know about all that, but hold on, that's dangerous. In fact, all throughout the New Testament, we see Paul writing to the new Christians and teaching them in the doctrines of Christ. We see it all throughout. Because he says, no, 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 you need to get to know more about Jesus. You can't just say, I'm a Christian, I just want to love Jesus without really knowing him. Get to know him, because then he tells us how to love him and how to love others. And, and he says, I've given you the grace of enrichment to get to know Christ better. But this knowledge we're going to see as we look over the next several verses, this knowledge is not just a informational, academic knowledge. He says, no, no, no. 
I want you to have the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. He's referring more to a experiential knowledge. Not only intellectual, academic. Do you know people who are a little too smart for their own good? I mean, they've got book smarts, but no common sense, right? Spiritually speaking, Scripture tells us there's people that fill with Scripture, but no application of it. I, I had privilege to work several years in a Bible college and saw a lot of young people who knew a lot up here. But it oftentimes didn't evidence itself out here. And, 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 and that's our, their desire. And they were there to try to grow in that. And how often do I know something without really knowing? Paul's praying for these Christians at Ephesus that they would be revived in their spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. You and I ought to get past the academical information. Is that a word? Academical? I just made one up. The academic the information stage of our Christian life. We ought to get past the information stage and get to the close personal relationship stage. Can I ask you? Do you really know Jesus? Oh, I didn't ask, do you know about him? Because I think we all know about him. But do we really know him? That's true in all of our relationships. We can know about somebody without really knowing them. That's why if someone ever comes up and says something about your mom, you may say, you may know her, but uh -uh, you're not going to say that because you don't really know her, right? What we think, I'm going to say this, what we think and know about Christ is the single most important aspect of our lives. I'm not sure what you mean. Explain that a little bit more. Our lives must be centered on who God is in truth and who he is as revealed in his word. Yeah. Here's what I mean. The world will tell you that you need to spend your days getting to know you. Yeah. Know yourself better. You, watch it. Ready? You be you. You get to know you. I don't know about you, but the more I get to know you, the more discouraged I get. I'm with Paul, old wretched man that I am. I found out I fell short here. I'm unfaithful here. I don't want to get to know me. But the truth of the matter is, the moment you became a Christian, the gospel came along and said, now it's your duty to get to know me. God says, no, no, no. Don't spend your life getting to know you. Spend your life getting to know me. Knowing Christ, wasn't that Paul's desire? We see in Philippians 3, that I may know him. The power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. You see, if I really know the Lord, then nothing and no one can convince me of something that he isn't. Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't believe any of that stuff because God's not fair. Ho hold on, hold on. Back up for a moment. God's not fair? Oh, oh no, that's not true. Oh, let me tell you what I know about him. Oh, everything that his word tells me and everything in my life shows me that, oh, he's a God of grace and mercy. Oh, don't tell me that God's not fair. Oh, God's full of love. How can a good God do this? Oh, you must not know him. You see where we're going? You may know about him, but you don't really know him and as a Christian it must be our single greatest desire and important aspect of our lives that we get to know Jesus he's given you he's given me the grace to do that do you spend the time to get to know him that's the only way we'll get to know him is spending time with him yes that means in his word yes that means in prayer I'm talking a deep time how about this word if we're not careful, some people get scared of this word. Meditation. What are we talking about? Just man the Lord. Yep. Allowing him to speak to me. People today are so scared of silence. Yep. We got music going on. We got earbuds. We got this. We got the radio on. We got to do this. Yep. We're scared to just be still and know right. that I am God. Hmm. Yep. 
Have you gotten along with the Lord recently? Because he's given you the grace to do so. Get to know him. That's why we sing, draw me near. Oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spend. When I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, I commune as friend to a friend. Draw me nearer. His grace allows you to have an intimate relationship with him. Praise the Lord for the grace of endearment to know Christ better. But second of all, not just to know Christ better, but to know the hope of his calling. And we'll spend our remaining time on this thought, verse number 18. The Bible says this, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Now, before we go any further, this phrase is so vitally important for us as Christians to understand. The eyes of your understanding is not referring to our head knowledge. That word understanding, the eyes of your understanding is speaking to the heart, not the physical heart, but where the thinking process is, where our very soul, where the seat of our emotions is. The, the innermost, sometimes the, the Bible refers to it as our soul. Uh, other places in scripture talks about it being our heart. Keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. So that, that's what we're, we're seeing in this phrase, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. How we think affects how we feel. And how we feel affects how we live. Let me illustrate that for a moment. Our human nature gets our direction on how we live based on our soul, based on our seat of our emotions, based on our wills. If you take a moment and think about an unfortunate experience in your life, ultimately, within a few seconds, you'll be a little bit sad or even mad. I don't know how, how unfortunate that experience was. But you take a moment and think about a good experience. It may put a smile on your face. Why? The seat of your emotions is affecting how you feel. I believe that's a scriptural principle. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Okay, And what Paul is praying here for these Christians and what we must understand, the eyes we're understanding being enlightened, he said, I want your hearts to be opened to receive all that God has for you in Christ. Not just that you have a head knowledge of it. Oh, no. But that it enlightens your heart, your soul, the seat of your emotions and wills. That's how far it gets into you. I want the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. You know, nowhere in scripture will you find ever that God speaks to your feelings first. Do you, what do you mean? What do you mean? It doesn't speak to my feelings first. Think about Romans 12 too. This is the most clear example, I think. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of how you feel. That's not what it says. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your emotions. No, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, the soul, the heart, the understanding, the seat of your emotions. That's how we're changed. I believe that Jesus Christ in his word gives us truth. Watch this. And that should direct our emotions and feelings on how to live. I think too many people, Christians included, have the caboose before the engine. What do I mean? I mean, they're controlled by their emotions. This comes in, we hear this, we fly off the handle, we go this way. Why? Because it just made me feel that way. Hold on. He's given us the grace of enrichment. He's given us his truth that should go so far deep into us that it controls our seat of our emotions and that then determines how we feel and how we live. That's why it's dangerous to have constant daily doses of media and the world's information. Amen. By the way, regardless of what channel you watch, Amen. I'm not talking only about MSNBC or CNN. I'm including Fox News in that too. It doesn't matter. Amen. As much 
all the world information that's coming into us, what's going to happen? Naturally, it's going to go to the seat of your emotions, and that's going to determine now how we feel. Why do we think we live in such a fearful culture? Because all this information has come in. It's gone to the seat of our emotions, and now we're living by this. And God said, no, no, no. I've given you my word. I've given you my grace to affect your heart, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened so that now, no matter what comes on the outside, you're so consumed and filled with my word that that controls your emotion, your wills, your feelings, and you live that way. Yes. Now, as you all just said, so many of you, amen, and we shook our heads. We all agree with it. So then let me turn it around. How much of this do you get? How much of this did you intake last week? Because this must direct us. That's why I preach so often. It's so important to have a daily dose of God's word. You need, watch this, look here. You need this every day. Because it can come inside and, and, and affect the seat of our emotions and the eyes of our understanding be enlightened. And now we can live today without fear, regardless of what's going on. Because we know that his word said, God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Now we can allow God's word to direct our lives and, and the caboose of our feeling comes way behind the engine of God's truth. I'm going to go a step further. I believe we ought to get a daily dose of God's word individually. I also believe we ought to be under as much biblical preaching as possible. I'll say it again. As much biblical preaching as possible. Not a pastor preaching his own thoughts or his own ideas, but preaching God's word. Why? I don't know about you. But when I come into church and I hear God's word preached, some of the times I say this, man, how did I miss that before? Wow, that's great. Oh, that's so clear. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Lord, for that. Oh, you're showing me this. Oh, I want to grow in this. Oh, I need to get more into that. That's what we need. And, and, and so, Pastor, it would be difficult on my schedule. I'm not, I'm not asking you to come to church so we can have big numbers or so that it looks good. I'm saying how important it is it for you, for the eyes of your understanding, to be enlightened. Because it's his word that does that. Yep. It's his word that controls, that gives us the grace of enrichment to know Christ better. We got hung up on that first part of the verse. There's still a lot more to go in that verse. So let's keep going. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling. Oh, do you know the hope of his calling for your life? Because he says, I'm going to open the eyes of your understanding so that you know. But I, I love one word in that phrase. That ye may know what is the hope of his calling. You know what? If I'm not careful, I'm going to walk around thinking, what do I want to do with my life? My premise is already wrong. Because it doesn't matter what I want to do and it's not my life anyway. We covered that last week. It's his. Amen. And God says, I want you to know the hope of my calling for you. Not what can I do? God says, I've got something for you to do. Figure that out. And by the way, he doesn't say figure it out and go hides it behind door number seven of 200 doors and good luck. No, no, no. I'm giving you the grace to know the hope of his calling. What, what is his calling? We covered it a few weeks ago. We see some of it in verse 4. According to him, chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, but that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You know one thing he's called for you and I to do? To be like Jesus. For uh, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Romans 8, 29. Romans 8, 30. For whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. I love 2 Timothy 1, 9. It makes it very clear. Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, 
but according to his own purpose and grace. Did you catch that? Yeah. He has called us, and it has nothing to do with our works. It has everything to do with his grace and his purpose. Do you see how all of Ephesians and really all of our Christian life revolves around him and his desire, not our own? Well, pastor, if I give in to that, he's just going to send me to the deepest, darkest jungles of Africa and I'm going to be miserable. So hold on a minute. You think someone who chose you before the foundation of the world, who loved you so much that he gave his life for you, that he's going to want you to be miserable? Oh, no. In fact, God says when we love him and we commit our works to him, he gives us the desires of our heart. It's just that when we love him and commit our works to him, he changes our desires to be what he wants. One day we'll be perfect like him in heaven. We'll get to that in just a moment, but I love Isaiah 43, 1. I hadn't really uh, considered this verse much before this week. It says this, but now thus saith the Lord of uh, the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel. Listen to this. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. You catch that? I've called you by your name. What a calling. Almighty God, creator. I know you and I've called you by name. You're, you're mine. He calls us by What a calling. He calls us to be like him. We can know the hope of his calling and that leads us to the last phrase. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. This is the second time we've seen this word inheritance. We saw it first in verse 11, if you look at it, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. By the way, I'm glad we have an inheritance in Christ. I'm glad we have something that's coming later. You know what some prosperity gospel preachers will tell you? You can live your best life now. That book, that preacher is not biblical. If I'm living my best life now, what do I have to look forward to in heaven? Oh my, I've got so much to look forward to in heaven. I can't, I'm not living my best life now with trials, with difficulties. How am I going to measure that up to God's word? God says, I'm going to give you the grace to go through it. Oh, you can live a joyful and happy life, but I've got so much more for you in heaven one day. Praise the Lord, I'll have a new body. Praise the Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll be no longer in the presence of sin and no more pain and no more tears and no more goodbyes and forever with Jesus. I'm grateful for that inheritance one day. So many people want their inheritance now. Give it to me now. I want to live this now. I want to experience this now. Oh, we can have peace and grace. Jesus now. But the best is yet to come, folks. Amen. Oftentimes our inheritance, you, you can't get inheritance until someone dies. I want it now. Give it to me now. And God says, I've got a lot for you now. And I've got even more for you later. And as good as that is, and as true as that is about that inheritance, I don't think that's what this part of the verse is referring to. In fact, I told this earlier, I had just about closed my notes up in my Bible, ready for the message this week. And I looked at that phrase one more time. And it's as if it jumped off off the page. And the Lord said, uh, look at this, you dummy. <laughs> See, I ever talk to you like that? I, maybe it's just me. <laughs> it says... Look at it. And what the riches of the glory of what? What the riches of the glory of his inheritance. And then I sat back in my chair. What does that mean? His inheritance. This is not talking about our inheritance. God says, I want your eyes to be enlightened to know the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. God, are you referring to me? I'm your inheritance. I'm nothing. I thought about Psalm 33, 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. You know the next part of that verse. And the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. There it is again. In other places. And you may wonder, what? Who am I? What do I have to offer God to be his inheritance? 
This passage clearly tells us that we are so precious to God that we're considered his inheritance. Pastor, what's precious about me? As I think about that, in me, I have nothing to offer. But what is this whole passage about? Me being in Christ. And you see, in Christ, we have access to the riches of his grace. Oh, we have access to what it says in that verse, the riches of the glory. Other places in scripture, we get the riches of wisdom, the riches of his love, the riches of his mercy. All in all, that amounts to quite a rich inheritance in the saints that we have in Christ. And one day, we'll stand before the Lord in heaven. Perfect, just like his son. The glory of his inheritance in the saints. That does something to me. I'm not precious to you, Lord. I, I want to live like you then. I want to be like you now. I've shared this with you before. Something my dad wrote in his Bible. He passed away in 95 as a 10-year-old boy. But I remember reading. I can see it on the page of the scripture. He wrote down, I want to live as much like Christ today so that when I get to heaven, there doesn't have to be much of a change. Why would I want to do that? Because I'm his inheritance in the saints. God's given me the grace of enrichment. To know him better, to know the hope of his calling, to know the riches of the glory of his inheritance. How can all of this be? It's according to the riches of his grace. Do you recognize the grace that God's given you at salvation? It's loaded. There's a lot of it. Grace of enlightenment, to know his purpose and our purpose. The grace of endearment, to have faith in the Lord and love for the saints. And the grace of enrichment, to know Christ better and to know the hope of his calling. Praise the Lord for the riches of his grace. Now, at this point, we'd never, normally we'd go to number four. We're going to save number four for next week but just to give you a little taste of what it's about so you can read ahead, so you can get your mind going on it. Look at verse 19. Oh my. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to, here's the title, the working of his mighty power. Next week, we're going to look at the working of his mighty power. That's what the next five verses talk about. You know what God's given you? Not just the grace of enlightenment and enrichment and endearment, but the grace of empowerment. Oh, he has given you access to his power today. Praise the Lord for the riches of his grace. Let's bow our heads and hearts together in prayer this morning. Thank you for listening.